once you get a sample of these microbes and you bring them back to the lab, um, can you talk about the process to culture the microbes that you bring or is it, um, do you choose certain microbes to culture over others? Um, how do they survive um, in a lab and do they act differently in a lab compared to how they do outside? I usually don't culture them at all. Okay. Remember one thing I want to do when I get them up to the surface or out of wherever they are is kill them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If they're, dead, if they're dead, then they're like preserved in the state that they were. And so okay. that, that is my research approach is to try to like get them to stop, you know, mm -hmm. stop all metabolic activity, like just hold still and then let me assess your biomolecules and see what, what you were doing when you were out in nature. Mm -hmm. do I, mean, you, I do culture things too, just not as much. Do you freeze them to get them to stop? Yeah, so freezing is a great way to do it. Although sometimes if you're in a remote location, it's hard to get something that cold. Or if you're at the bottom of the sea, you can't freeze them immediately. So we have this really concentrated ionic solution called RNA later that we can mm -hmm. douse them in and that kills them too. Okay, okay. And once you, um, once you are able to study them, do you isolate or do you look at the, I think it was the 16S, RNA unit to try to um, identify where they are in the um, g g uh, like the species. What like what genus and species are they, and where do they fall in the phylum? Is that how you try to go about it? Yeah, and we chose that gene basically for historical reasons. That ended up being the first gene that people started looking at, and so now we have a big database of all the organisms in that gene. And so we just continue looking at that gene. And what, what the gene encodes is part of the ribosome. And the ribosome, of course, is this machinery that makes all the proteins in every living cell, as far as we know. And so it means that it's pretty evolutionarily stable. And so it doesn't change, because any little change is going to be lethal to the cell. So mm -hmm. um, it's changing very, very slowly. And so it's, it's the kind of gene that we can use to tell the difference between something that's way far away on the tree of life from something else. Like mm -hmm. we wouldn't use our version of 16S in our, in our bodies. It's called 18S because it's slightly bigger. Like we couldn't use that to tell apart humans from each other because ours are all identical. And I mm -hmm. think it's even almost identical with a lot of other animals too. Mm -hmm. But we use it because we're looking at really deep evolutionary relationships and it's good for that. Mm -hmm. And when you compare different microbes, are there like, do they share similarities or are they completely different in terms of this microbe that you found here is genetically completely different than the than another microbe. Um, how close are they, genetically speaking? Well, we can find things that are, well, I don't know what our, our closest thing would be, but we, to some extent, we always find differences. Like they're okay. not identical, mm -hmm. but but we do see, I mean, we, they're similar enough that we can say, oh, then this is in this family. This is a disulfococcus or mm -hmm. something like this. We know the genus of this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can know the species too. Mm -hmm. And once you, once you find them, how do you, do you get to name them or, because I know that uh, part of the, part of discovering a new species is getting, I guess, a chance to name it. Yeah. How does it work with, um, uh, prokaryotes that are undiscovered or that don't have a phylum, do you just generally class them into a phylum and, or do you have to go like, okay, new species, this new species, that, and then just try to name them or? You have hit on a nerve. Like we are in turmoil right now because we okay. had this microbiology had a beautiful system of nomenclature mm -hmm. and taxonomy and how we determine what, what a new microbe is and what it is named. To do that, you have to submit your name officially to this international body of, of scientists who review your name and decide whether you can have this name or not. It's very organized and it's awesome. To do this, you have to have a pure culture. So you need a microbe that grows fast without any other microbe around, which mm -hmm. is hard to come by out of nature. <laughs> So it's a tiny subset of microbes that fit the narrow, narrow requirements for naming by the international, this organized society. 
the organized society recently held, they recognize the problem because people like me have been wringing our fists all the time and saying, you're missing all the diversity of life and we need a not naming system for the rest of it. Like help us because currently it's like anybody can just write a new name in their paper. And if your paper gets accepted, then that's the new name. And it's just, it's the wild west and people are renaming things. It's just a big mess. And um, so they recently held a vote, um, I believe last summer, to determine whether they were going to allow type material for new names that were not from pure cultures. Mm. And they thought about it carefully and they said no. Oh. <laughs> and here we are. So you Why have. Are you? I don't know. Yes. So then you have like a bunch of uh, different species of microbes that are known to be out there, but they can't be named or classified or, um, or even if you're able to study them, you can't say this organism has these traits because you can't name it. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's a real problem. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're of course moving forward and we give things names, but mm -hmm. none of it is official and none of it is organized. And it means that things get renamed all the time and it's, it's not great.